This is the 20th video in this series describing the mathematical mesh. The mesh makes computers easy to use by making them more secure. In the first two videos, I asked the question, how can we persuade the internet of 5 billion people to adopt the mesh? You know, how do we make the mesh take off? How do we how do we get them to adopt it? Because the devil is in the deployment. Well, what happens if they do? Can we run the mesh at a scale of 5 billion users? Hello, I'm Philip Han Baker, and in this final podcast, I'm going to be showing you the strategies built into the mesh to allow it to operate at scale. So, so what we want to be able to do here is we have a mesh service and the mesh service is in the cloud of course the cloud just being somebody else's computer and the mesh service itself is going to consist of some number of individual machines and you know these are probably going to be uh, you know, virtual machines that are being brought up and torn down as needed on some, you know, elastic cloud, you know, it might be Amazon, it might be uh, digital option, you know, doesn't really matter what. But I want to be able to automate the process of managing these mesh hosts to the greatest possible extent. So that when a new host joins the constellation. I want that host to be able to sell some administration uh, point or that, hey, I'm a new host. I've got these capabilities. I want to join and start serving. And at that point, I want it to get all the necessary cryptographic keys it needs to operate, all the necessary configuration data, uh, I want to configure the internal network uh, of the hosting facility so that the data arrives at that uh, host as, it need, as is needed. And once all that is set up, I want to drop the necessary SRV and TXT records into the DNS to advertise that we now have a new internet host ready to provide mesh service and then when a when a host leaves or alternatively if it fails to respond to some health check or heartbeat type condition within a particular period we've got to reverse all of that to take it out of service and of course we want to be able to maintain logs of everything that happens so that no matter what disaster falls us, you know, we can take out any of these hosts at any time, including one of the hosts that's performing coordination. It's got to be fault tolerant so that anything bad can happen and the mesh service will still stay up. And I said that I want the mesh to work at a scale of 5 billion users, but it doesn't need to be 5 billion users at a single mesh service instant. In fact, I don't think that that's uh, what I want. I mean, uh, I would much be much happier if there are hundreds of, provide, of mesh service providers and we don't end up with the mono, monopolistic monoculture that the web has turned into. But, so we want, but we're still going to be able to have to uh, support very large communities, because if you're going to support uh, 5 billion users with 1,000 hosts, well, that's still 5 million users per host. So we've got to think some about um, scale at some point. And the thing about scale is that there's basically two, two scales that matter. There is one host and there's lots of hosts. And if you, you know, the one host case is really simple. You know, you basically ignore the redundancy problems and so on. But as soon as you start to think about supporting this service with 
you know, redundancy and fault tolerance and so on. At that point, you start to have to get real. And if you're going to be sensible about it, you might as well think about moving from one to a hundred. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so how do we manage host keys? And of course, this is the biggest cause of breaches of private keys. Uh, they end up being written out to uh, log files that backup logs, you know, the, the keys end up being written to backup tapes and the backup tapes end up being lost. Or alternatively, they get written to a disk drive and then the disk is sold or stolen, whatever, and the private key goes off there. So what we would like, one of the things we want to do here is to have a key management service that can prevent that uh, key leakage problem. And so this is one of those places where, again, I plan to use the meta cryptography to distribute the keys within the mesh so that when a host starts up, the host will have its device profile and it will ask the master uh, for that particular service, please provision me with an activation record and a TLS certificate for me so that I can start doing the service. And then it will, the uh, master server will give the other half of the key to that service. And that service can now, can, can now provide, um, can act on behalf of the um, system. Uh, and when it shuts down, well, that key that it was given by the uh, master, that's just going to be forgotten because it doesn't ever need to be written out to disk. It can just be in RAM. So that's one place where I want to be applying the meta cryptography to prevent the key uh, leakage problem. I want to have a host management service so that when the host starts running, it can ask this management service, what are my configuration data? Uh, which cryptographic keys? Which services do you want me to provide? Do you want me to act as a mesh service coordination host? Uh, you know, do, you want, do you want me to be the host that users go to to uh, create a subscription? Or am I just going to be servicing some part of the database? Am I going to be a master that is actually responding to queries? Or am I going to be a hot backup? And what we want to do really is have a sort of raid-like situation where um, a, ser a host that is providing you know, the, the regular mesh service of maintaining mesh catalogs and synchronizing them and so on, what we want it to do is, if this is the totality of the mesh account space, it's going to have a chunk of that account space that this particular host is the authoritative host for providing the mesh service to the users. And then a second uh, chunk of space, oh, let's do that in a different color. And a second chunk of space for which the, uh, that particular service is acting as a hot spare for something else. And so we end up with a situation where if any of the primary servers goes down at any time, there's a hot backup that has a complete uh, copy of all the catalogs and spools for all the users that were being serviced. And so we want to achieve that split, splitting and be able to tell uh, the hosts that are in service, oh right, we have increased the number of server hosts in the constellation, so you were serving this much, we've taken this bit away from you and given it to some other host. And so shave a little bit off. So we need to have some mechanism like that that allows us to dynamically rebalance the mesh service to respond to changing demand over time. And of course, what we would like to do is to also balance this with the storage needs so we can pare down the number of hosts in service to the bare minimum 
uh, necessary while still being able to ramp up quickly enough to uh, cope with spikes in demand. And so we need to have that host management service and that needs to be integrated with the DNS for the site so that when these hosts are coming up and going down that uh, the DNS records necessary are, being, are tracking those. We want to have ongoing management, so once a host has come up, we want it to be reporting in to some centralised control on a regular basis, say, hey, I'm alive, and saying what its current load is. Uh, and we want to be able to use that current load indicator to judge how many of the, you know, how many hosts to bring up, how many to shut down, how to minimise our cost of service on the elastic cow, while still ensuring that we always have redundancy and we always have one backup of all the data that is dependable and won't be uh, discarded no matter what. You know, and the, you know, this has been done before, but Death Sequence gives us a new, new tool that makes it much easier to do than it's been done before and it allows us to, you know, we've, this is the first time we've been able to design a protocol from the scratch so that it is designed to scale to millions of users. We never got that, that opportunity with SMTP. Making SMTP services and IMAP services scale, you know, that was an afterthought and, you know, a lot of very clever engineering record was necessary as a result. So we have the DARE sequence and we can use it for creating log files so that every change that happens in the mesh is going to be logged somewhere and those logs are going to be split across redundant machines so that we can be sure that we're not going to lose that, that data no matter what. And of course DARE sequences and that incremental encryption capability we get from DARE, that's going to be extremely useful in order to make those uh, log files uh, maintainable because everything's encrypted we don't need to worry so much about where they happen to be stored and of course we might even be using threshold cryptography there so that the log files uh, don't become a you know are, are not accessible to a single individual and we can get the separation of roles and all that stuff One point that we've not got to yet is catalog optimization. And yeah, here's the problem. So we have a catalog, their catalog. So it's an append only sequence. And the last record has, can have an index that gives us a fast lookup into any point in the um, catalog. And that can be, you know, that, that, that's, that's a pretty scalable approach for a catalogue that gets up to, um, you know, 10,000, 100,000 uh, entries even. But at some point, we start to run into problems in that even N log N starts to grind after a while. And we've also got this problem that you know, if the index is stored in the container, in the sequence itself, then we have to update the, you know, we have to keep rewriting it all the time. So one of the ideas that I have is to be able, is where we have a file, this is mapping a sequence, I want to have a companion file that contains just the index. And so when we change the sequence, so we add a few pieces, to a sequence, we're not going to make those changes to the supplementary file immediately. What we're going to do is we're going to do that in a lazy background tasky sort of way so that we've made updates to, you know, 20, 30, 100 catalogs over the course of the past hour. Okay, now we will re-update all the catalogs that are stale and 
we will create new index files for them. And so this can be an ongoing background task. This is continuously looking at the index records, seeing which of those index records are out of date by the most amount, and creating a new index record. And this allows us to have immediate access to the parts of the file that we need for use in the protocol um, without having to you know, do that complicated uh, fix up of the index records and the delta indexes and all that stuff. So it's an adjunct to the catalog that will be updated as a background task. So that's something that I would like to be able to do. Another piece that hasn't been, that uh, I've considered from the design point of view, but haven't quite uh, implemented yet, is considering what happens when we add information to a DARE sequence. And the question that arises is what happens if the computer goes down at the very minute, you know, right in the middle of the write. So we're adding these records and the computer system crashes here. So we have a partial write. And so I think that uh, it'd be useful to spend a bit of time looking at the low level file semantics and all that um, atomic transaction stuff uh, and seeing how we can really lock down that um, interaction. What I think that we probably need to do is each time we write something to the end of a sequence, we want to put a guard record at the end. So we start off by writing the very end part of the piece that we're trying to append and then go back and write over the whole thing. And so this guard record that we write is going to have two states. The first, when we first write it, we write it as an incomplete guard record. And then as we complete the write, it turns into a completed guard record. And so that's another thing that maybe we need to have a look at. And of course, this is going to need some really deep level understanding of the operating system semantics. Uh, and I'm not a, an expert there, so I really need help building that type of thing from somebody who really understands file systems at a deep fundamental level. And not just one, because we're going to need to do this for Linux, we're going to need to do it for OS X, and we're going to need to do it for Windows, and they all behave really differently at that level. I know about enough here to know that I don't know enough to do that properly. Another thing that uh, comes up is the ability to purge a sequence in place, and that's a feature that would be rather nice for the software distribution problem. And here you have the problem of, well, if you're trying to purge the, re the sequence and, you know, it's okay if you're trying to close large gaps, but if you're trying to close small gaps up and the gaps are smaller than the records that you're, tr that you're trying to close up, you end up with a situation where you tr your updates tread on themselves. And so we might want to look at whether there's a smart way of doing that purge in place or whether the only way of updating these containers, uh, sorry, sequences, is to copy them off to another sequence. And again, this might be some where, something where a real fundamental understanding of the file system semantics would pay a lot of dividends. And uh, that's it. So in this presentation, which is the last presentation on the mesh internals for quite a while, uh, I've shown you how we plan to apply the mesh to the problem of making the mesh run at scale. And with these types of enhancements, I believe that we should be able to run mesh services that can support, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of users uh, without the need to, for recourse to the traditional uh, two-tier architecture uh, while still maintaining uh, 
you know, the traditional uh, features that we want from a, um, a large system. So thank you very much for watching. Again, please click like, please click subscribe. And this is the end of the C series of pr presentations on the mesh, but it isn't the end of my presentations on security technology. What I'm going to be doing going forward is to produce a, a course on information security and a course on cryptography for information security. So those should be coming along as soon as this uh, course completes publication. Those uh, new courses should be starting up. So please watch out for those and please click like and please click subscribe. Thank you very much for watching this far and hope to see you there for the next presentations. Thank you.